Good evening and welcome to the final uh, presentation from the ICT for Life Sciences Forum for 2012. I'm uh, Ross McFarlane, I'm a, a patent attorney and partner of the IP firm Phillips Orman Fitzpatrick and we're one of the founding sponsors of the ICT for Life Sciences Forum. This evening we're uh, delighted to have an international visitor to talk to us about a subject which I think is important for all of us, not just for the scientific community but for everyone that lives on this planet. Uh, and that is, of course, how the Earth's biological, chemical and physical processes are affected by us, by humankind. It's, a, a, of course, a topical subject, and you might have read in the newspapers yesterday, I think, uh, reports, or in fact a warning from the uh, United Nations climate talks in Doha, reminding us that the Earth's temperatures are projected to rise by six degrees over the next century. So our guest, Owen Gaffney, is a science writer and journalist and currently Director of Communications at the International Geosphere Biosphere Program based in the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. Owen will explore how global changes driven by the Industrial Revolution and the even larger changes that have come about through globalisation uh, are creating a global interconnectedness uh, and what this means for our future. So can we please all join together and welcome Owen. Uh, thanks very much, Ross, and I'd like to thank um, Simon Torek from CSIRO and Neil Byrne uh, here in Melbourne for, for inviting me to, to, to speak to you today about, um, about the, the Anthropocene, the idea of the Anthropocene and uh, uh, the geology of humanity. Um, and, uh, and, and I'd like to thank the ICT and um, Life Sciences Forum. I think this um, interface between ICT and the sciences over the next decade promises to be uh, one of the most um, exciting areas of scientific innovation. So um, you, you, I think you're all in, in, in the right place. And it's a wonderful place to be in Melbourne as well. This is one of my favorite cities. Um, currently it's minus 12 in Stockholm where I live. So it's um, absolutely, um, I'm loving the temperatures. Um, so and it's glad to, I'm glad to see uh, so many here tonight as well. Um, and I, I have a, a theory about that. Um, the, the, the title of the talk, um, Welcome to the Anthropocene, um, the Geology of Humanity, um, my, my theory is on, on the word um, geology. I, I think you could add the word geology into any talk and it would instantly make it sound uh, more, more interesting and more alluring and, and, and exciting. Um, you know, the, 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 the geology of the human heart or the... Uh, the, uh, uh, the geology of the US presidential election. And uh, I, I don't think you can do the same with uh, other scientific disciplines, you know, the biology of the human heart or, you know, the, the economics of the US presidential election. Or it doesn't quite work. So I think there's something specific about, about geology. Um, I should make a disclaimer now. I'm not a geologist. Um, um, my, my, uh, as Ross said, you know, my background is in, in journalism, but, but way, way back, um, and, and, and global change science. But my, my background really, um, my degree was in astronautic engineering, in spacecraft design and satellite design, those kinds of things. And I've always been very interested in the very big picture, uh, big picture thinking and, um, and those ideas. And uh, that really came about um, when I was about 14 or 15. I uh, saw an, an advert, NASA were advertising in a science magazine for um, their, their new composite, um, this new poster they had of the, the Earth at night. And I, th I thought this was absolutely uh, fantastic. So this was you know, pre-internet days. I had to uh, fill in a form in the science magazine and write a check and send it off to the US. And it came back to, uh, to my home with a poster eventually. It just blew my mind. It was incredible. And the thing that really blew my mind about it was that um, you know, the astronauts were talking about uh, their life in space and uh, looking down at our planet and how insignificant humans seemed to be on the planet. You know, they were just filled with the wonder of, of, of nature. They said the only thing that humans could see, uh, the, the only thing, the only um, significant sign of humans from space was the, uh, was the Great Wall of China. And, uh, and then this arrived and I thought, well, <laughs> I mean, you know, I didn't understand cognitive dissonance at that time, but I think the, the astronauts may have been suffering from it because how could they not have uh, noticed this, this huge impact? And this really is what we're, we're going to be speaking about this evening, um, the concept of the Anthropocene. So uh, the Earth is uh, moving out of its current geological epoch, the, the Holocene. Um, humanity is largely responsible for this, this exit. Um, and humanity has become a, a, a global geological force. You know, we have the impact of an ice age or, you know, a meteorite impact. 
Um, so we'll be discussing this in more detail. I'll fast forward a few years from my childhood to, um, to, to earlier this year. In March this year, I, I, I created a, a data visualization with Felix Ferrandes Shen as a, a data visualizer in Canada. There's a big science conference in London called Planet Under Pressure, and it was, it was released there, and it got um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interest from, from the media, and New York Times picked it up from BBC and things like that. And um, that was all well and good. Then um, in June this year, the United Nations uh, had their, their largest conference to date, 50,000 people gathered in Rio for the Rio Plus 20 summit, the, uh, the summit following um, the, 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 the Earth Summit. Um, and I got a call from the UN a couple of days before the, uh, uh, the event, and they said, um, we'd be interested in your film opening the Rio Summit. And I said, oh, what, what do you mean by opening the summit? And they said, well, well UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is going to walk out on stage, he's going to make a five minute speech to the 188 heads of state and ministers and then they're going to show your film. And I thought, oh, that, <laughs> that is opening the summit, and that's, that's, that's pretty good. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll have to click out of here and um, here we go. This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much, yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. So I'm going to focus for a few minutes on, on this, this idea that, you know, in one, one lifetime, we have, uh, we have made this, this kind of impact on the planet. So this is the uh, anthropocene.info uh, website. So IGBP um, worked on what, what have the major changes been in the last uh, 200 years or so since the start of the Industrial Revolution. We, we put together a series of graphs. The important thing here is the, the timing on them. So um, I'm going to flick through um, a number of graphs and we're going to look at uh, from 1750 through to 1950. So we've got population, GDP. So 
foreign direct investment, just keep looking at the, uh, the years here, 1900, 1950, 2000, water use, fertilizer consumption, urban population, uh, paper consumption, motor vehicles, telephones, international tourism, fisheries, shrimp farm production, um, domesticated land. Um, so what was the planetary response to, um, to, to, to this growth, to this uh, you know, uh, huge change in, in human activity? So atmospheric CO2 concentration, nitrous oxides concentration, methane concentration. Methane's a, a, a greenhouse gas more potent than carbon dioxide. He Northern hemisphere, surface temperature, ozone depletion, tropical rainforest and woodland loss, uh, climatic disasters, coastal zone, nitrogen flux, biodiversity loss. Um, so, you know, we're getting this uh, very strong signal um, that some scientists have called um, the, the, the great acceleration. And here are the, uh, the graphs. This was really the um, foundation of the, uh, the first synth synthesis from the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. And, you know, uh, in 2009, uh, Ban Ki-moon said our foot is stuck on the accelerator and we're heading towards an abyss. And this, this was really the accelerator he was talking about. In terms of the Earth system, what are we playing with here? Uh, this is a data visualization from uh, Adam Nyman showing um, on the left hand side we've got um, water if it was represented as a um, single, um, as a sphere compared to um, the Earth. And um, on the right we have um, the, the global atmosphere. So this really is our, our life support system. You know, if you have a patient in hospital and they're you know, connected up to um, some sort of life support system here, uh, you can see uh, a number of uh, uh, parameters on the screen. Someone's temperature, respiration rates, heart rates, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and I guess you, you don't really need to know the full details of uh, what it's showing there. That uh, The important thing is that there's a, a regular signal, uh, that things are coming through regularly. And this is uh, you know, the sign of you know, something, something healthy. So does, does Earth have a pulse in the same way that, um, that humans would? Now this is the 800,000 year ice core record from um, the Epic Group. This is taken from, they take ice cores from Antarctica that go back 800,000 years. So if you look at this graph, we've got a red, red line, semi methane, blue line, temperature, green lines, carbon dioxide. And uh, these go back 800,000 years. Here's zero, uh, so the present day. Um, this is 200,000 years ago uh, when modern humans first appeared um, in Africa. And uh, as you can see, I mean, uh, these go up and they go down, and these, um, these lines are um, all very regular, and uh, we, we can see a sort of a, a, a steady pattern for over this, this period of time. Okay, this is um, carbon dioxide and methane levels now. Uh, so we've got um, you know, 392 parts per million um, CO2, um, 1,800 parts per billion, billion um, methane. And uh, these are significantly higher than, um, than what we've been experiencing for at least 800,000 years. You know, this is very much um, uh, beyond, beyond the natural boundaries that we can see uh, for that period of time. And certainly, you know, if you're a doctor looking at um, a, a patient with, uh, uh, with these kind of vital signs, you'd be asking yourself, what happened next? In the last few weeks, and uh, this was mentioned by Ross, um, you know, there's been a, a number of reports coming out from um, uh, some, some various groups. Some, uh, uh, so for example, the, the World Bank put out a report in a, a few weeks ago um, saying turn down the heat, uh, we need to avoid um, um, heading for four degrees. This is following um, you know, sort of green radical groups like PricewaterhouseCooper and KPMG who, um, who've produced um, reports in the last uh, few weeks and KPMG earlier this year um, also saying, um, talking about global scale um, issues and, uh, and, and how uh, humanity needs to manage them a little bit better than we are at the moment. And then um, earlier this week, the Global Carbon Project, led by Pep Canadel um, in Canberra, uh, put out the uh, Global Carbon Budget. Um, and again, this has uh, generated a lot of headlines worldwide. Uh, this is the, the growth rate, this is the pattern we're on. Um, so 2.6% uh, between 2011 and 2012. Um, carbon emissions uh, globally. This is a graph, again, uh, expanding out uh, this previous graph. We're looking at 1980 to the year 2100, and we've got um, a series of lines here. We've got a red line uh, at the top heading out to 2100, and down at the bottom we've got a blue line. Uh, the red line, um, if we follow that trajectory of CO2 emissions, we're heading to four to six degrees uh, by the end of the century. Uh, and of course, um, it's, uh, it's not going to stop there. It'll, uh, we may end up with uh, feedbacks in the Earth system and uh, temperatures could keep on going four to six, um, end of this century, um, six to eight the next century, etc. 
So uh, and we're getting into um, a very, very dangerous territory. Um, the, the blue line is uh, the emissions reductions um, pathway uh, to stay below two degrees, uh, to have some chance of staying below two degrees. Um, and you can see that the black dots chart our progress to date. Uh, so if you look somewhere after 2000 up to 2012, we're, we're, we're charting above the red line um, taking us into this very dangerous territory. And there's uh, uh, the, the Global Carbon Project were putting out some very, very serious warnings earlier this week um, about this trajectory, um, particularly as we've um, you know, uh, politically committed to trying to keep below two degrees. So I'm going to show another data visualization now, uh, moving away from that. This is um, the global dams that have been built between uh, 1800 and 2009. Uh, this has been uh, uh, created by uh, our chairman, James Savitsky, from Colorado University. These are very large dams. And what we're showing here is uh, changes to the global water cycle, how the, uh, how the global water cycle has um, been changing over the last 200 or so years. Uh, yeah, so okay, we're up to 18, uh, 1840. You'll see the British Empire, the countries of the British Empire, um, dams starting appearing um, around now. You'll see uh, something happening in the US. We're going to get uh, a lot more dams there. They're going to explode. And then uh, towards 1950, 1960, we have uh, uh, Mao, Mao Dezong in uh, China. We see what happens to China. Huge growth in large dam building there, and then South America and Africa uh, are much quieter. There we go, you know, we're changing the carbon cycle, um, we're changing the water cycle. NASA's Landsat has done some uh, fantastic work uh, over the last 25 years. They've released um, some compare and contrasts um, uh, earlier this year to celebrate 25 years. So this is uh, Dubai in 2000. Uh, Dubai, Dubai in 2000, 12 years ago, this is Dubai uh, 2010. Um, we can create our own islands and not only can we create our islands, we can decide what shape they're going to be. Uh, we more, move more sediment and rock uh, than uh, every year than, um, uh, than all natural processes. Uh, this is Las Vegas in 1984. So you can see the huge urban expansion there in 20, 1984 to 2011, and, uh, and also you can see the, uh, the water supply to Las Vegas going down in that time. So this is the Pearl River de um, Delta in China uh, in uh, 1973, um, 2003. You can see massive urbanization in this area. I mean, it's just incredible. So, uh, you know, when we're talking about deltas, 24 of uh, the 33 major deltas are sinking. 500 million people uh, live on deltas. Uh, you know, uh, Jakarta in Indonesia is, uh, um, sits on a delta. It's uh, between 74 and today, parts of Jakarta have sunk four meters. 85% uh, of deltas have been hit by severe flooding um, recently. Uh, so uh, we're building ourselves up for, for major problems there. Uh, we're an urban society now. In 2008, we passed a landmark. Uh, more than half the popula population of the planet now live in cities. We will build more urban areas in the fir first three decades of the 21st century than all of history combined. To house this uh, huge uh, growing population, we will need um, a city of about one million people, or the equivalent of a city of about one million people, um, built every 10 days between now and 2100. So uh, this is a satellite uh, image of Bolivia, uh, the Bolivian rainforest. And you can see that it's, uh, there's been a lot of change here. Uh, just, uh, just as an idea of the scale of um, humanity, you know, to grow our crops, um, we use an area about the size of South America. To, for our livestock production, we use an area um, just larger than, than Africa. I mean, the scale is, uh, is phenomenal. 90% of total mammalian biomass is made up of humans and domesticated land. 10,000 years ago, that was 0.1%. Things are changing very fast. So when we're talking about the Anthropocene, the, the idea um, really came about in 2000 when um, uh, Paul Crutzen, the Nobel laureate, and uh, he was a uh, vice chair of IGBP at the time, um, and he published uh, an article in our, in our magazine, Global Change magazine, um, on, on this concept of the Anthropocene, um, and then, then published an article two years later in the, uh, in the journal Nature. Uh, the, the idea really came about at our scientific committee meeting in um, uh, Cuenavaca in, in Mexico in 2000. And uh, we, we had a series of talks at the meeting. Uh, and uh, there were several um, uh, uh, paleoclimatologists, so, um, so climate specialists, uh, looking at uh, past data. 
And uh, they were talking about the, um, the Holocene and uh, changes in the Holocene. Uh, the Holocene is the, the, the geological period over the last uh, 10,000 years. Uh, since the end of the last ice age, uh, we've been in the Holocene. Um, and they've been talking about changes in the Holocene um, comp right now compared with the past. And uh, th as the discussions were going on, uh, you, Paul Critson was visibly getting more and more agitated and, uh, until it, um, it reached a point where he, he just said, stop using the word Holocene. We're not in the Holocene anymore. We're in the, and he was trying to find the right words for it. And uh, eventually he came out with, with Anthropocene. And then director at the time, Will Steffen, uh, the Australian Will Steffen said, it was quiet in the room for a while after that. And, uh, and this was uh, the, the coffee break. This, everyone was talking about uh, what had happened in, in the meeting room. Um, and uh, they, they felt that there'd been a significant, interesting development there. But the term Anthropocene, actually, um, you know, we can date it much further back than that. Um, back in 1992, Andy Revkin, uh, the New York Times journalist, uh, brought out a book called um, Global Change. And he, he talks about the Anthropocene. We're entering an age that might someday be referred to as the Anthropocene. After all, it's a geological age um, of our own making. He said if, um, if he and his editor were better at Latin, then they, <laughs> they would have been given the credit for, uh, for the concept. So, but you know, you can go back to 1989 and uh, Bill McKibben, uh, another uh, writer and um, activist, you know, brought out The End of Nature, talking about uh, very similar, similar concepts. And in fact, um, US biologist Eugene Stormer, um, he, throughout the 1980s, uh, he, his lectures uh, mentioned the Anthropocene, but he never wrote about it um, until he, until he co-authored an article with, uh, with Paul Crutzen. And you know, this is the Earthrise photo, um, Earth at night, and uh, going back to 1969 and the land, moon landings and then the Club of Rome and the first Earth summit in, in Stockholm in 72, uh, you know, where a lot of these ideas of uh, you know, planetary scale forces were being, uh, being discussed. But we can go back even further. We can go back to, um, you know, uh, there was a, a Russian geologist, uh, Vladimir Vodansky. Um, he, he discussed life as a geological force. Um, and uh, he, uh, he, he published a book, um, it was first published in English in 1997, but uh, was published in, in Russian much, um, much earlier, um, talking about ideas like the newosphere, which is uh, the, the mind building in power and, uh, and controlling the environment. George Perkins Marsh, uh, he's, uh, he was a diplomat in the US um, back, in, uh, uh, back in the turn of the last century. And he, uh, he, he, is, he was also uh, one of the first environmentalists and naturalists. And uh, he put out a book in 1864 called Man and Nature. And he had it reprinted 10 years later in 74. And he changed the title a little bit. And this was slightly prophetic. The Earth as Modified by Human Action, Man and Nature. In that, you know, he discusses uh, the biosphere concept uh, that developed by um, Edward Seuss. Um, but more importantly, there was a, an Italian geologist and, uh, and, and Catholic priest called Antonio Stepani, who um, uh, was around in, uh, uh, who in 1873 um, produced a text where he describes the, um, the Anthropozoic um, era. In, in, in that, he says, you know, um, he described humanity as a new telluric force which in power and universality may be compared to the great forces of nature. So some of these ideas that have really come to the fore and entered the public imagination in the last few years have really been around for, for a significant amount of time. So when did the Anthropocene start? Was it the discovery of fire uh, 125,000 years ago? You know, we got uh, this, this image here the, as, as, as humans develop. Was it the dawn of agriculture, you know, um, 8,000 years or so ago when we started really changing um, the land around us in quite a profound way? And, and we did have some impact on the atmosphere with our, you know, methane emissions, etc. But was that big enough to, to drive us into um, uh, a new geological epoch? You know, was it um, 1800 at the start of the Industrial Revolution? Uh, and, and Paul Crutzen has been arguing for that. Or was it the digital age, really, the 1950s? The jury's out, and this would be, uh, you know, take a long discussion, um, I think probably for decades with the scientific community. But Paul Crutzen, notably, um, he first wrote that it should be the start of the Industrial Revolution. This is when, you know, this kick started something major. But now, in an article last year, he said, well, perhaps, in fact, it, it should be 1950s, um, when we really had this great acceleration, this is when things started changing um, dramatically. And there's, there's a, a good reason for that as well. There's, um, uh, around that time, in 1945, we had the first 
atomic bomb blast in, in Trinity. And th that's, that, that blast and, uh, and subsequent um, atomic detonations have, has left a radioactive layer in sedimentary uh, record. So th that'll be a clear marker for, for, for future generations. But who decides on whether we have an Anthropocene or not? Um, and they do not take this decision lightly, but it's the International Commission on Stratig Stratigraphy. And they are, uh, they've set up a working group on the Anthropocene, and uh, they are, they're going through their long processes to, um, to discuss the idea and, uh, and whether it, uh, it merits um, you know, the change uh, from, from the Holocene to, to a new boundary. But the rest of the world is not waiting for this decision. In 2013, there's, uh, there's at least two journals, scientific journals, opening, starting up um, on the Anthropocene. This is uh, Elementa, uh, Science of the Anthropocene, uh, a new open access journal. Um, and Elsevier are launching a journal, um, also in 2013, on it. In, and in fact, in the last few years, uh, there's been over 400 papers uh, mentioning the Anthropocene in, in the scientific literature. The, the Economist last year uh, had a front page, Welcome to the Anthropocene, and uh, it, it's, it's really reaching out to beyond the scientific community into the, uh, the, the wider public imagination. Um, the BBC a few weeks ago was running um, uh, a, a four-part part, part, um, series on, um, on the Anthropocene. They used a still from our film. Um, to, to, to promote it, the age we made. So, I mean, and there's, there's a lot of these things in the pipeline and uh, there's the, the Age in Australia has written an article about, uh, about it. You know, there's loads of, um, it's, it's, it's really bubbling up. Um, and I, I guess um, I've been speaking about um, m many of the sort of, I guess, negative impacts on it, but the, I think um, on the Earth system, um, but I think the Anthropocene concept uh, is, a f is a fairly neutral, neutral concept. I mean, there are, there, there are many pluses and, and minuses to it. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, a, sh a short film um, on, uh, by, um, made by the BBC. It's, it's about four minutes long. And it's another data visualization um, produced by Hans Rosling, um, who's uh, an academic at Karolinska Institute in, in Stockholm. It's, uh, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a stone's throw away from me. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work, too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before, animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health, life expectancy, from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and 40,000 dollars. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago, in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe! And now I speed up through the 1920s and the 1930s. And in spite of the Great Depression, Western countries forge on towards greater wealth and health. Japan and some others try to follow, but most countries stay down here. Now, after the tragedies of the Second World War, we stop a bit to look at the world in 1948. 1948 was a great year. The war was over, Sweden topped the medal table at the Winter Olympics, and I was born. But the differences between the countries of the world was wider than ever. United States was in the front, Japan was catching up. 
Brazil was way behind. Iran was getting a little richer from oil, but still had short lives. And the Asian giants, China, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Indonesia, they were still poor and sick down here. But look what is about to happen. Here we go again. In my lifetime, former colonies gained independence, and then finally they started to get healthier and healthier and healthier. And in the 1970s, then countries in Asia and Latin America started to catch up with the Western countries. They became the emerging economies. Some in Africa follows. Some Africans were stuck in civil war and others hit by HIV. And now we can see the world today in the most up-to-date statistics. Most people today live in the middle, but there are huge differences at the same time between the best of countries and the worst of countries. And there are also huge inequalities within countries. These bubbles show country averages, but I can split them. Take China, I can split it into provinces. There goes Shanghai. It has the same wealth and health as Italy today. And there is the poor inland province Guizhou. It is like Pakistan. And if I split it further, the rural parts are like Ghana in Africa. And yet, despite the enormous disparities today, we have seen 200 years of remarkable progress. That huge historical gap between the West and the rest is now closing. We have become an entirely new converging world. And I see a clear trend into the future with aid, trade, green technology and peace it's fully possible that everyone can make it to the healthy, wealthy corner. Well, what you have seen in the last few minutes is a story of 200 countries shown over 200 years and beyond. It involved plotting of 120,000 numbers. Pretty neat, huh? And that's, that's fantastic. I mean, that's something we have to keep remembering that, um, I mean, there's so many positives, um, but we need to find some sort of way of managing the, the, the global commons. This is uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, Nobel laureate in economics, um, who, uh, who, who died earlier this year, unfortunately, uh, just before the Rio Plus 20 summit. Um, and, you know, she said the, the concept of the Anthropocene heralds a profound um, shift in perception of our place in the world. I mean, I, I think that's true. I think when we look back on um, the, the, the history of the, the 20th century and, and all the, you know, the big, the big landmarks of get events, the Depression, the, the, the World Wars, the, 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 cold, the cold War, etc. Um, I mean, a few hundred years from now, um, they might pale into insignificance. The, the big story um, was uh, the humanity you know, became this, this, uh, this geological force. So much of the work of um, Eleanor Ostrom um, did in her lifetime was really looking at um, how, to, how to manage common resources. And she found that um, you know, when you look at uh, uh, fisheries or forests or, um, or, or, or other common areas, um, that they're often better managed um, by the people themselves rather than some sort of um, bureaucratic system. Uh, people found ways to manage um, common resources um, themselves. And she had a, a series of, um, uh, of, of rules and, um, and ways of understanding this, which I'm going to come to in a, in a few minutes. Later in her life, though, she really turned her attention to managing the global commons. You know, how do we manage the atmosphere, the oceans, the, the fresh water for this growing population? I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm going to um, come to something slightly different first. Here we have uh, Facebook, um, and I'm sure uh, this being an ICT and life sciences forum, you'll all, all be uh, very familiar with, uh, with this, or know and love Facebook, I'm sure. Uh, Facebook was, is remarkable. In, on the 14th of September this year, it hit um, uh, 1 billion users. It only started in, in 2004. The way I look at Facebook is um, uh, this, uh, it, it's the pinnacle of the Industrial Revolution. Um, it's the industrialization of, uh, of, of friendship in some way. Um, and, and the globalization of small talk. No, nobody asked them to do this, they, it just happened, uh, which is, uh, seems, seems fairly remarkable. But the statistics when it comes to um, ICT and uh, you know, global networking uh, are just incredible. We've got 2.3 billion internet users, 30% of the, the, the global population, 6 billion mobile phone subscriptions. By 2015, 60% of the world population will be online. And you know, this is the mobile network um, in 2009, undersea cables for Africa, and then 2012, uh, the, the internet cables. So the whole globe is getting, is getting linked up in, in quite profoundly. Within a decade, 
all but the most marginalized in societies will be connected in new and profound ways. And this is, this is a very, very exciting um, development, I think. We, we don't really know what way that is going to go. But we do know that uh, the power of these connections um, is, is changing um, societies in quite uh, interesting ways that certainly haven't been predicted. You know, um, here's uh, something from the Arab Spring. Uh, nobody predicted that. Um, you know, uh, the, the regimes thought the youth were divorced from politics. They didn't notice that young people were connected among themselves. This is from a, a Syrian activist uh, in the Financial Times. Uh, so, this, so this new connectivity is, is, is creating something quite interesting. Um, this is the, uh, the Occupy movement. You know, we are the 99%. These very, very big uh, international movements have, have started up and very, very quickly and, uh, and uh, having quite, quite an interesting effect um, on, on power. Uh, and this is with one third of the world um, connected up. In Nature, um, a year or so ago, uh, in fact, December last year, uh, there's an article called The New History, and they discuss some of these, um, these ideas in it. Discontinuities are precisely what you would expect if you consider today's societies from a complex systems perspective. And discontinuities there, they're talking about these you know, big, big changes in, uh, uh, like the Arab Spring, for example. Um, and social media, the article goes on to say that social media um, have the potential to facilitate qualitatively um, new collective behaviours. I, I find it interesting because we don't know where that's going. But going back to Eleanor Ostrom, when she talks about um, the global commons, um, you know, her work on common resources has shown that isolated anonymous individuals over harvest common pool resources. But she also says that simply allowing communication or cheap talk enables participants to reduce over-harvesting. So if people are um, able to talk about their resources um, and have some sort of understanding of them and discuss them um, openly and freely, um, then they have a better chance of managing them, um, she thought. And I wonder, would this apply um, to, the, to the global commons? But she also said we need reliable knowledge. Certainly the internet at the moment doesn't provide reliable knowledge, but, but Google are working on that. Um, and individuals like to see how sustainability benefits whole groups um, and trust is very, very important for managing um, common resources. You need to build trust. And I think um, there's uh, the internet and social networking in particular does help build some of these uh, qualities in, uh, in quite an interesting way. Um, I mean, um, just going back to, uh, to Syria. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a website called Bamboozo, which is like YouTube for, um, for live streaming. You know, you can just sign up and you can use your mobile phone to, to live stream some, um, uh, some video of what's happening. So I was uh, having lunch with the, the owner of Bamboozo um, uh, in, in Stockholm a few months ago. And he said that during the Syrian civil war that he could predict where there was going to be outbreaks of violence or fighting because people would be signing up for uh, Bamboozer um, in the hours or days before, and then, um, and then, then things would happen. So um, it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, this, this builds up trust because uh, you know, regimes like Syria can't keep things to themselves anymore, um, that the, 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 the news gets out. Yeah, so Facebook, uh, the, the whole social networking issue is, um, is, is quite profound. Uh, and, and is, is something to watch in the, the next decade. And in fact, I would go so far as to say, I'd, I'd coin a phrase, um, you know, keystone innovations on the way to sustainability. Uh, there's, you know, s several, um, certainly, uh, you know, the internet is one, uh, but I think social networking is another um, keystone in innovation that we'll, uh, we'll come to uh, appreciate more and more. And of course, it wasn't designed to do that, uh, which is another interesting fact. And just to perhaps support that a little bit more, this is uh, Dan Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winning um, psychologist. Uh, and uh, I've just finished his book, uh, Thinking uh, Fast and Slow, um, uh, yesterday. And the, the last paragraph of it is that there is a direct link from more precise gossip at the water cooler to, to better decisions. Um, and I would say uh, that with social networking, uh, we're heading towards having uh, you know, a global water cooler that uh, promotes gossip. The Rio Plus 20 Summit, going back to that, the Rio Plus 20 Summit was the biggest outcome from that was the idea to create a set of sustainable development goals. So going beyond the Millennium Development Goals for developing countries, which um, have had uh, a reasonable amount of success, um, to creating sustainable development goals that are universal for, for all nations to find um, a route through to sustainability. And um, 
uh, to put us on some sort of pathway. And I think um, th these are going to be fought over for the next, uh, next few years and um, probably um, you know, finalised and announced in, in about 2015. I would certainly think having some sort of goal to create you know, ICT access um, for all uh, a, it would be um, reasonable and achievable in the next uh, 15 years. Um, we, we're, we're on that, um, that, pr that route already. Perhaps I could uh, wrap up with uh, some conclusions on this, that uh, you know, in one lifetime, humanity has become a global geological force. I mean, this is just incredible. Since the, since the 1950s, this has happened. You know, Earth is moving out of its current geological epoch, the Holocene, and action on global sustainability is, is absolutely essential. We need to start moving on this very quickly, as, as highlighted by the Global Carbon Projects report earlier, earlier this year. And uh, could social media be one of the several keystone um, innovations as we move towards a sustainable society? Uh, so finally, as this is ICT and life sciences, I would say, um, you know, like DNA, the word Anthropocene is destined to leap from the world of uh, science and into the global lexicon um, over the next few years. Because like the word DNA, I think the Anthropocene concept has uh, profound implications for our world view. It will be part of the process of, um, moving, of changing our, our world view to something that is truly global. These are the uh, two websites, the anthropocene.info that I was talking about earlier, and uh, I have a, a blog, um, the Anthropocene Journal, and uh, here's some, some ways of uh, contacting me. Um, but I'd uh, just uh, finish by thanking the organizers for inviting me here today. It's been, uh, been wonderful speaking to you. So thank you. thanks for the wonderful talk, and can we all thank Owen once again? Sure, thank you. Um, there's some exciting news regarding a couple of uh, individuals who have been very supportive of the ICT for Life Sciences Forum that we'd like to uh, announce. Um, and these are two individuals who were recently elected as Fellows of the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering. The first is Mr Glenn Whit uh, Whitewick, uh, who heads IBM's Australian research effort and is the company's CTO. And he was recognised for his contribution to the development of Australia's ICT industrial R&D base. We also have Professor Stan Scafidis of NICTA and the Centre for Neural Engineering from the University of Melbourne. And he was recognised for his vision, leadership and technical accomplishments in industry research and academia. Now these are two very prestigious uh, appointments and I think uh, we should congratulate both Glenn, who is I think here with us tonight, I'm hoping, and uh, Stan, who's currently in the United States on these uh, outstanding uh, achievements. So congratulations to both of them. And the, the final task tonight is to uh, announce the details of the 2013 Graham Clark Oration. Uh, as many of you will know, the Graham Clark Oration was established in 2008 by the ICT for Life Sciences Forum to honour the uh, contribution of uh, Laureate Professor Emeritus Graham Clark for the development of the bionic ear in the 1970s. Uh, the uh, 2013 oration will be the fifth such oration and we're hoping it will continue the uh, strong reputation uh, that's been developed, uh, making it one of the major public science events in Melbourne. Now, we were hoping that Professor Clark would be here this evening, but unfortunately there's an illness in his family, and so he has asked his good friend uh, and member of the Graham Clark Oration Organising Committee, Professor Emeritus David Pennington, Chairman of Bionic Vision Australia, to announce the details. So, Professor Pennington, over to you. Thank you, Rob. Well, the Graham Clark Oration has become a very important event in uh, uh, Melbourne's life and it uh, does celebrate the remarkable achievements of Graham Clark and his team in, in the development of the first cochlear implant, harnessing all of the uh, technology of implantation. Uh, the last uh, Graham Clark Oration was given this year by Professor Dame Linda Partridge. And you'll understand that the oration is capable of, of achieving uh, huge interest in the, in the Melbourne community and more widely. Four events later, the Graham Clark Oration has rightly become recognised as a major public science event. And uh, there has, at the audience, been almost 5,000 attendees since it began and a thousand people have attended 
the Eurasian dinner for sponsors and their guests. The 2013 Graham Clark Oration will be, in fact, a very remarkable one. It is to be given by Mr. Jeffrey Lamb, who is president of Global Policy and Advocacy for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on Monday the 29th of April at the Melbourne Exhibition Centre. Jeffrey Lamb, I'll just tell you a little about him. He leads the Foundation's international policy and advocacy team and its engagement with governments and international institutions. He was previously Managing Director of Public Policy and a Senior Fellow of the Foundation's Global Development Programme. Before joining the Foundation in 2006, Mr Lamb held several senior positions at the World Bank, most recently as Vice President of Concessional Finance and Global Partnerships. In that capacity, he chaired a series of international negotiations through which governments provided the largest increase in more than two decades of World Bank funding for the world's poorest countries, and subsequently agreed to the financial framework to forgive multilateral debt of 40 countries. An Irish citizen, Mr. Lamb was born in South Africa and educated in South Africa and the United Kingdom. He was a fellow and deputy director of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex. He was a member of the board of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria from its founding in, until 2006 and has been a board member of the International AIDS Vaccine Institute since 2000 and its chairman until 2008. He served as chairman of the International Negotiations for Replenishment of the African Development Bank's, Bank's concessional arm um, with the African, African Development Fund in 2009 and 10. The oration will review the extraordinary success of the past half century in reducing mortality and disease. It will show how investments in health have been critical for economic growth and reduction in global poverty and help bring the goal of the end to absolute global poverty within a generation. But in respect of the huge basic health advances of recent decades, there have been, which have been the easy part, for example, big investments in routine vaccination and cleaner water have already delivered most of their dividends. And meantime, <coughs> we may face a long contraction <coughs> in public finance, which will make it much harder to fund the future investments. <coughs> What needs to be done to ensure the next transformation of global health and make the end of absolute poverty unattainable is a real question we have to face. Geoffrey Lamb, as the 2013 oration, has an extremely well credentialed and globally experienced individual who will no doubt inform and inspire us with his thoughts and messages. In fact, we've got a great deal to learn from the tradition of public philanthropy in the United States in this country as we look to the future in a difficult situation of reduced public funding of so many of our important issues. It's been an honour to make this announcement on behalf of Graham Clark, and I hope you'll be able to attend this important event. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you, David, and we look forward to attending the oration in April. Well, that concludes the uh, presentation and the presentations for 2012. So thank you for your support of the ICT for Life Sciences uh, Forum. Um, we hope to continue to uh, provide you with the quality of uh, pres presenter and presentations that you've experienced this year um, and to uh, 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 highlight some exciting developments at the interface between the ICT universe and the... Uh, um, the, uh, the life sciences universe. Uh, so as uh, one of the sponsors of the forum, um, I could, I'm sure I can speak on behalf of the other sponsors to say that we're proud to be associated with the forum. I think it's an important entity. 
and uh, we look forward to uh, helping it with its future work. And before we go, I'd just like you to all join me in thanking Owen once again for his presentation. <laughs>